Ken Bates played a pivotal role in bringing Chelsea into the 21st century. Often outspoken, the former chairman took over in 1982 as the threat of administration hung over the ailing club. He tackled the issues of the day, with hooliganism plaguing the game in the 80s and oversaw some of the most successful times at Stamford Bridge, redeveloping the ground during the 90s and securing its long-term future. But his time at Stamford Bridge was not without its controversies. A well-publicised boardroom battle with investor Matthew Harding made front-page headlines. Bates finally sold up to Roman Abramovich in 2003 and left his position one year later. Earlier this season, he sold his penthouse overlooking the pitch as Chelsea prepared to redevelop the ground once more. Now enjoying retirement at the sprightly age of 86, the former Chelsea chairman lives here in Monte Carlo. But it's those days back in southwest London that remain closest to his heart. I knew a guy in the insolvency business and I bought one or two business off of him. So he me up one day and said, are you interested in, I've got a football club you could be interested in. I said, oh, tell me, he said, Chelsea. I knew a little bit about Chelsea. They needed 300,000 within seven days. Why would you get involved with such debts like that? What made you think you could turn it round? Well, hey, I wasn't a bad businessman. B, I love the, and the idea of the challenge, Chelsea. So I went to the game the next day. And I couldn't believe this. They just bounced the wages check. There were about 36 people in the boardroom, all the members of the Mears family, and their kids, and their and the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, but the th four course meal, our finest champagne, finest wines, brandy, port, cigars. I thought, they've got no idea this lot. They had a chauffeur whose job was to d drive round the directors and senior if they needed to go to London because of the parking. This is in 1982. You streamlined the business, would it be fair to say that? No, I took a machine gun to the business, just hacked and packed. There's so many people that are doing no work. When Bates introduced electric fences to deal with the club's hooligan problems, Chelsea made front page news. It was an idea he picked up from looking after cattle on his dairy farm. Oh, you're the guy who wants to electrocute his fans, all that kind of crap, you know. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why I've had a love-hate relationship with the media. Because when people say things that are wrong, I tend to correct them. And I found, you accept it, of course. I find some people in the media can hand it out, but can't take it. You know, it's very simple. I'm hooliganism and rife. But it wasn't just football. Mm -hmm. It was obviously in football, but um, it was in society generally. But football was high profile. And Chelsea had a particular problem. I mean, the, the National Front was used as their... Uh, unofficial headquarters. It's all climbing over the fences. So finally I had a, I had a dairy farm and one of the guys working said, well, Mr Bates, why don't you just put the, the cow control? So we put one of the six foot nine high in the, they went up like that and it's six foot nine. Now the mayor of London, I'm going to ban it, take it, get a high court. I said, well, they don't, they're not, don't give a bugger about ordinary happy working class people. They're very concerned about six foot nine hooligans. You might get an electric shock. So the GLC wouldn't let you turn it on, but did you think you were never going to turn it on? No, I'm never going to turn it on, because I knew they'd stop me. But it, it concentrated the mind, yeah. and all of a sudden, they started doing things. Bates inherited a struggling team. During his first full season at the club, relegation to the old Division Three was avoided by just two points. You had the so-called great team of the 70s, Osgord and Hudson and all the usual ones, who were talented footballers but had a terrible lifestyle. And the kids I inherited are apprentices of the 70s. Do you follow? Yeah. yeah. And the trouble is they led, they learnt about the lifestyle but didn't have the ability. Chelsea won the second division title in May 1984 but lasted just four years in the top flight before being relegated down to the second division. Bobby Campbell took the team back up at the first attempt. Silverware of sorts arrived in 1990, but the full Members' Cup win was a quickly forgotten triumph. But Chelsea's image changed when Glenn Hoddle arrived in 1993. You have to give credit to Hoddle. He was never very successful. What did he win apart, as a manager, apart from Swindon Town? But he came in and changed the mindset. He tried to get Chelsea away from the booze culture and that kind of stuff that 
epitomise English football. Yeah. He introduced a different type of training. He tried to change people's thinking. Eight-year-old Armando Dinello wants to be Rude Hullet, and he wasn't the only youngster at Chelsea's training ground today with the Dutchman's name on his back. By signing up for the Premiership, Hullet and the other new foreign players have given English football a major lift, according to the Chelsea manager. I think it's the most exciting uh, season that the, the English league has had in its history, I really do. Chelsea have been tipped as one of the teams to watch this season after securing the services of the former European Player of the Year. For his part, Hullet is looking forward to the challenge of English football and says Chelsea is his sort of club. Everything is new and, I, uh, yeah, I like that. It's the same thing when I came to Milan. It was also new and they didn't want anything. And to, to go to a team that already won a whole lot of things is not my, it's not my team. Do you think that changed the DNA of the club? That they went from a club that throughout the 80s had struggled for, to be fashionable, if anything, but had really struggled on an image basis to one that was becoming more cosmopolitan, more attractive? Well, it was. I don't forget, and then we were playing in Europe. Mm. Now, again, also attracted different people. The hooligan element had gone. The stadium were looking better. There were better facilities for the fans. I remember my son telling me years ago, you know, the average working class guy, he leaves school at 15, 16, spends a lifetime making widgets, retires at 65 and dies at 70. His, his life revolved around pub and club. And I said, let's make the club his second home. And that's what we did at Stamford Bridge. The battle for ownership of Stamford Bridge had been going on for years. Bates eventually won control from property developers, but soon realised the ground's long-term future needed securing. He came up with an ingenious idea and formed a company called Chelsea Pitch Owners. In 1997, this non-profit organisation purchased the freehold and the naming rights of Chelsea Football Club. I'd spent 10 years fighting to get the ground, from 82 to 92. And when I got the ground, not bad, you know, so a bit complacent, well done, Ken, smug, self-satisfied. And uh, somebody shouted out, yeah, that's right, Batesy. What's going to happen when you die and your grandchildren flog the bloody club because they're not interested in it back all over again? And I thought, you ungrateful <laughs> And I few, I didn't say anything to him, but few me. Got to me Bentley and drove off. Oh, I thought about it. He was right. He was right. But you don't forget, the great Mears family who founded the club built it all, and the grandchildren completely destroyed it. But we we'll formed a company, Chelsea Pitch Owners. So it became a company. A hundred pound shares, you can buy as little as one. But then, no matter how many shares you bought, you can never have more than a hundred votes out of seven million. None of are going to get a profit or a dividend. And then the pitch owners would lend, would give a 999 year lease to the football club. But they'd also retain the name Chelsea Football Club. So if the new owners, when I'm dead and buried and forgotten, ever moved anywhere else, they were owning the ground, they'd lose the name Chelsea Football Club. Matthew Harding's investment helped take Chelsea forward again. The lifelong fan invested £5 million to build the new North Stand and joined the board. But the pair fell out spectacularly and Harding was banned from the boardroom during a bitter power struggle. I took him for lunch at, m at my local pub, the Imperial Arms, which later became his local pub. But we sat in the garden eating oysters and drinking wine. He said, well, I'm not too keen on partnerships. He said, go you know, and think about it. I said, yeah, sure. But I'd never see him again. He came back and said, look, I'll put up the whole five million. That's what I'd like to do. So we put up by way of a convertible loan, which meant it was a loan. Mm. But I paid full interest on it. Chelsea paid full interest on it. He never gave Chelsea anything, contrary to popular disbelief or misconception. He hasn't given me a good reason as to why he should become chairman and what he would do uh, if he did. And in the absence of specific answers to those questions, um, he hasn't got a chance. What about the position of Glenn Hoddle in all this? We understand that he is not uh, signing a new contract yet and he's waiting to see what happens over the chairman's position. Glenn has always said he would renegotiate his contract in February, March of next season and that remains the case. And I think it's totally unethical for Matthew Harding to bring the question of Hoddle and the manager and the staff into uh, his rhetoric because he's playing with people's lives. But I can make it quite clear uh, that the quarrel between Harding and Bates, which Harding has precipitated, has got nothing to do with the playing side.
The Cold War continues. Bates, who missed the game through illness, sent another icy blast Harding's way in the match programme, again demanding to know his plans. But Harding, who's currently banned from the director's box by Bates, attempted to play down a rift that's as wide as the Grand Canyon. Well, I've, I've known Ken two, two and a half years. We get on a lot better, I think, than the, some of what's gone on in the papers and on the, in the media would say. And uh, I'm sure we'll sit down and have a chat quite soon, but there's no rancour coming from me. It seems the majority of Blues fans want Harding to win the Battle of the Bridge. Chelsea's football is currently reduced to a sideshow as Harding versus Bates dominates the news. It's Harding's time, he's all for the supporters, not for the actual club. He doesn't want to build up this, uh, we want a hotel, we, we want the ground, we want everything. He's all for the football team and that's what the supporters are for. What we want is the person best suited to manage that club and I think at the moment it has to be Matthew. Ken Bates had his, had his run, he's, he's, he's saved the club, I've got no, no half feelings for him, but I just think it's time for a younger, more blues orientated blood, and that's Matthew Harding. Were you surprised at how opinion turned against you a bit at the time? No, not at all, because what had happened is, I had a love-hate relationship with the press, with the media, and sued a few of them. And I was a man, who's caught in the press, lovey-dovey. And of course, without being great, Quite a few you got, you know, don't check your facts, believe if I did what you want to hear and print accordingly. Didn't make any difference to me. And of course he loved the fans as well. Mm -hmm. but, I, but he couldn't understand why I just ignored him. Didn't take any notice. The death of Harding in a helicopter accident in October 1996 shook the club to its foundations. So was Chelsea, do you think, an ever a stable situation in terms of the way it was being run in the 90s? Well, it was when he went. It was still being run stably, but he was, he was doing, being done in spite of his behaviour. Right. He could have been such a positive, because in fact he had so much to offer. Yeah. But the trouble is he wasn't, he wasn't using it to, in the right way. If he left any positive legacy in your eyes, what would it be? You just got your answer. After the break, the former Chelsea chairman looks back at the trophy winning and title challenging years during his tenure at the bridge when more managers came and went in the quest for success. Ken Bates oversaw some of the most colourful times at Chelsea. By the mid-90s, the stadium and team were starting to take shape. After succeeding Glenn Hoddle, Rude Hullett won the FA Cup for only the second time in the club's history. And more big-name Continental signings were on their way. Viali's first experience of his new club was only slightly less chaotic than Rome in the Rush Hour. But that had much to do with the Italian media here for Euro 96, being interested in a former favourite. He was even asked if he'd prefer Tony Blair to be a Chelsea fan rather than John Major. Viali admitted he's unclear about English politics, but his new boss says some things he must learn. They don't like diving here, you know, <laughs> all these things, so I have to tell them. Was it a difficult job selling the Premiership to him? No. No, I had only one telephone call with him. Viali scored 123 goals in Syria, and the Italian press believe he can be just as successful in the Premiership. They fear, though, he may not be the last to wave them goodbye. Ciao, ciao, tutti ragazzi. Hullet's time at the bridge as both player and manager under Bates was a great success, but he left in dramatic circumstances midway through the 1997-98 season. Chelsea chairman Ken Bates chose Sunday's match programme to give the latest explanation for February's controversial sacking. Bates said he went because Colin Hutchinson, the managing director, wasn't prepared to pay a huge percentage of his player budget for a part-time playboy manager who carried out his lucrative commercial contracts at the expense of training. A statement like this will hurt your reputation. I think it's very bad. You can't be no, not on the training ground and still have good results, winning the FA Cup, be second. Be, you can't. That's impossible. So I think that uh, you have to be very careful what you say. For a while, did you get on? 
we've got an, yeah, we've got an, an awful lot. Gianluca Vialli stepped into the breach in exceptional circumstances. His first game was a League Cup semi-final second leg against Arsenal, with the team looking to overturn a one-goal deficit. When we sacked on it, offered him the job which he took, because we lost 2-1 to Arsenal in the semi-final of the League Cup, and Hullet had given the ball away. Petit. And no offside, given chance for Olaas! So Vialli went in, sat all the players down and said, yesterday is yesterday, tonight is tonight. We'll all have a glass of champagne and toast the future. Tremendous effort, oh my word! Talk about punishment, what a goal by Di Matteo! What an unbelievable sweep. This is just unsavable. Absolutely unsavable. A standing ovation from this huge crowd and, more particularly, from the man in charge for the new manager. In your first game as player-manager, you take Chelsea to Wembley. That must be a dream yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can't imagine the pressure before the game because uh, this was a, a very unusual situation and uh, we knew that uh, we had to get the result out of the match and uh, I think I'm too old for this kind of match. I'm going to have a heart attack very soon. Dennis Wise. Still got his cross in. It's a goal. for Chelsea. Just five weeks into management, achieved something that many managers never get in their career. And there it is. He used to spend every Sunday morning uh, in the Penn's house on the terrace eating Irish smoked salmon sandwiches and drinking champagne. And in fact, he got to the stage that my youngest son, who's come over from Ireland, would bought an extra pack for, for Viali. <laughs> Did you have any favourites from the 90s no, players? I hated them all. <laughs> <laughs> there must be some. No, no, no. You, you, you see, I say, who's your favourite Well, how do you compare a goalkeeper with a goal scorer? You're looking at different players playing different jobs. And I'd like to think that I respected all of them, otherwise they should have been on the playing staff. Italians still the fashion in the King's Road, but Claudio Ranieri promises a new style of management. After a summer of discontent at Stamford Bridge, the incoming coach is set to instil some Roman discipline to Chelsea's foreign legion. So he's going to have a lot to live up to, so I assume that he's of uh, sufficient standard. Never heard of him, but I hope he does good for us. Here's Gronkiar, got away from Risa! It's a wonderful goal! It really puts Liverpool up against it now! Yes, but Gronkiar has Chelsea on their way to the Champions League! Chelsea will... It's good for everybody has, it's good also for the, uh, the club because everybody know the club need a little money and the money is always uh, 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 welcome. <laughs> Claudio was a long termist. Um, wherever he went, he was successful. But he did it in his time because you can't he didn't believe you could buy success long term. And he was building a club. And he was, he was a gentleman. We know um, how important it is for the club and for the fans and for ourselves for, for next year. And uh, now it's up to, to the club to sort of fulfill our wish and get Franco signed. So these talks, if the chairman and the manager said, Franco stay, is that all it would take? <laughs> Yeah, it might be like, like that, you know. We have to, we have to see it really. It's uh, Chelsea has always been uh, first choice for me, honestly. But Gianfranco Zola left that summer as Chelsea began a new era off the pitch too, with the arrival of Roman Abramovich. It put to me that this man Abramovich was interested in buying the club. I thought about it and I thought, well, I've taken this club a long, long way. 
but it needs more money to take it further. So did the club desperately need the funding at no, that no, stage? No, 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 no. I mean, there's lots of stories going about that on the point of oh, rubbish. We always paid our interest on time. In fact, the tradition, they used to ring up uh, the bank 10th of December every year. Is it true Chelsea aren't going to be able to pay their interest? I said, no, we'll expect it as you. And on the 15th, when it went through that. Why do you think so many stories circulated at the time then? Or good, news, good news isn't news, bad news is. And a few of your lot were trying to get their own back. And I thought Bombers would come in and continue doing what we were doing, what I've been doing, at a an accelerated space pace. But instead of evolution, it became revolution. Mm. And again, uh, lots of reasons about that that I don't intend to discuss today. But it totally changed. Do you think the character and the fabric of the club changed? So was it possibly the right time to leave on a personal note? Do you? Yeah, I think it probably did change, yeah. Well, don't ask me the question, you tell them. Well, I'm asking your <laughs> opinion. The Chelsea t of today is very different to the Chelsea yeah. of my day. What would your advice be to a current club chairman on the running of a football club? If, if they could take one word of wisdom from you, Ken, what would it be? Well, the one word of wisdom would be don't. <laughs> <laughs> football is very different today. It's partly the responsibility of the media. You've now got a different type of owner in. Would you say you were the right type of owner? Well, I was one of the, the right group of owners who spent time concentrating and building up their club. And in the old days, don't forget, many of the clubs were owned by locals, businessmen, wanted to put somebody back to their town. Jack Walker, Blackburn Rovers, yeah. is an example. Been many years, probably Bob Lord of Burnley. But one guy you've got to remember is Steve Gibson. Um, Self-made man from Middlesbrough. Club been in administration on the verge of bankruptcy. He bought it over, took it over, rebuilt it, and still got it today. And uh, we're very good friends. He calls me Uncle Ken. I won't tell you what I call him, but uh, and uh, I think he's done a marvellous job there. Do you still take great pride in their achievements and what they do? They're the first things I look for. And uh, the second one I look for is Manchester United, hoping they've lost. <laughs> As someone who sits in the stands to this day watching them, do you, do you enjoy watching them? What do you think of Antonio Conte? Well, the only thing I say about Mr Conte is that, he's a, to my mind, he's a gentleman. Yeah. A refreshing change from his predecessor. And um, I don't think I've ever heard him make any or much criticism of the um, opposition. Do you like the way he conducts himself? Mm. And I also like the overgrown school kid up and down the <laughs> <laughs> It's good, isn't it? You can relate to it. Your penthouse at Chelsea Village was sold to make way for the development. Was that a, a sad moment or do you look back on it with fondness of all you achieved there? An amicable arrangement was made. And all I can say is the Russians were very generous. As it's getting ready to be developed, then naturally things are changing. Staff are leaving and finding new jobs, um, etc., etc., etc. And so the atmosphere of Chelsea Village has changed. There used to be five restaurants now, there's, there's one on the tea shop, for example. And so you, you don't have the. Uh, I used to meet the fans a lot and talk to them and have fun, you know. Have you got hopes for what they're going to do there? what they could achieve? Well, I haven't seen the details in full, but it's very ambitious. And if you could sum up your time at Chelsea all those years, how would you do it? I'd do it all over again. Sky Sports. Feel it all.